Welcome back to So Bad It's Good, presented by Betches Media. Now, we cover a lot of things on this show, and today I'm so uh, I'm thrilled to be able to cover this. I think this is such an important docu-series that I just watched. Uh, it's called Let Us Pray, A Ministry of Scandals. Now, it premiered on uh, ID Discovery, but now you can find it on Max. Uh, it actually hit the top 10 of all Max shows when it premiered, and it's on there, and it is just uh, it's a harrowing depiction of the IFB, the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church Movement. Uh, the four-part series is directed by uh, just this amazing woman who's already had this amazing career, and I think it's all led up to this story. Um, Sharon Lees, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Sharon, I mean, this, just first off, congratulations, but it's weird to congratulate somebody on a story that is so... Uh, you know, like I said, so harrowing, you know, you go into the lives of these women and you really tell this story of abuse and of these men abusing young women. And they all seem to kind of go by the same pattern of behavior, which the docuseries points out. How did you get involved in this? Why did you want to tell this story? Yeah, well, first of all, I do want to say congratulations to um, the women who participated in this show because, um, I mean, their their courage is really amazing and deserves to be congratulated. And those women, um, by the way, Ruthie Heiler, I believe, Kathy Durbin, Amanda Householder. I mean, these are just really amazing women that are brave enough to share this story because a lot of women – you know, do not have that, you know, there's a, there's a pressure campaign usually in these situations, but these women were all brave enough to, to talk. And I think that's the good that comes out of all of this is just hearing their message. I'm sorry to interrupt oh, you, but yeah. I just wanted to yeah, point really. out their names. I mean, ampli yeah. I mean, it's so rewarding as a filmmaker and as a storyteller to be able to amplify voices that have been silenced for so long. Um, it's, it's a different type of reward than from any other um, project that I've worked on. Um, and then you, you asked me how I found out about it and how I got involved. Um, there was a uh, newspaper, um, a series of uh, articles um, called The Spirit of Fear, um, written by um, Sarah Smith. And um, it was like four articles. And I read the articles and I thought, wow, this these are amazing women coming forward. And I was so uh, taken aback that I had never heard of the IFB before. And yeah. uh, and and they are they're so uh, ubiquitous. So I wa really wanted to um, find out more. And so my curiosity about it, um, you know, led me to talk to Sarah Smith. And then she put me in touch with some of the women. And I found out that they had cases that were like, you know, ready to go to court. And I was like, this is really ripe for, um, you know, for this, these stories to be out. Yeah. And I do want to highlight Sarah Smith wrote this for the Fort Worth Star Telegram, uh, you know, amazing reporting that actually led to this. Um, and you do this great thing in the, the docuseries at the very beginning, kind of give us a, a peek into this the churches is, you know, there's a there's a preacher destroying a TV. These are kind of like the preachers, you guys, from Footloose, John Lithgow's character of like dancing's horrible. Women need to wear skirts, all of these things that we look at and and you can kind of laugh at in a sense. But then you realize it's so real. This is a real story. This isn't a movie. These exist. And it's this culture that, you know, quote unquote, families, good families were raised in. But it's very men are this way and women are supposed to be this way. And if you aren't this way, then you are sinning against God. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so insular. And um, what's been amazing that with the release of this series and the, and the women seeing this, they like know everybody in the archival footage that we have. And they were sitting in, in those, in some of those sermons, like the smashing of the TV, like they were there. And uh, I didn't even know that when, when, when we put it in there, but that's all they knew. And so it's, and for some of them, it's pretty new to be out into the real normal world right now. Yeah. And I would imagine, or I kept imagining watching this, we're hearing these brave women's stories, but I'm sure there's so many women's stories we're not hearing that this will potentially give them the courage to step forward and kind of report their cycle of abuse, because it all seems to be, like I said earlier, the same pattern of behavior. And these are in different areas, but they kind of all like, it's a, a young woman in like Bible study and then is approached by their preacher or a side. Pre I mean, that's the thing that was scary that you realize, oh my gosh, you can connect the dots on all of these stories. 
Yeah. I mean, the stories are all too familiar. And when they, when they get together and they talk about like the grooming process and, and the types of things that were done in terms of the, when a pastor was found out about, then he shuffled to another church, even though they call themselves independent churches, they just, they help each other um, and perpetuate um, this horrible abuse among, among and they're the protected women. a lot of the times. That's yeah. the other thing yeah. that's pointed out. They're protected in so many of these situations. Um, you know, as a filmmaker, when you approach this, you see these articles, you see these women highlighted. And then, you know, can you tell us a little bit about behind the scenes of what it's like to approach these women to gain their trust? You know, because you have them in the docuseries, you know, there's some great shots of these women just standing on the street or, you know, they're actually having to be filmed in, a, in an environment and having to, you know, recall all of these memories. How do you gain the trust of these women for them to be so open? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and it's something really important that filmmakers always have to think about. And uh, first I'll say that trust is something that you, that you keep gaining and regaining. Um, so each time you're with them, each time you interact with them, you have to be aware that you, um, that your trust is on the line and, and there's lots of different levels and types of trust. They want to trust that you're going to actually tell their story in a way that they're comfortable with. And that really honors their story. They want to trust that they can feel safe around you, um, to, to tell your story. They want to trust that you understand what, what they're actually saying and that you're really, that you're really listening. So there's so many different levels of trust and some of the ways that we tried to help build trust was um, we had an all female crew most of the time. So we had a, I love a, that. a yeah, our DP, um, uh, Yamit Shaminovitz is, um, she's amazingly talented and she's also a very sensitive woman. So it was great. I mean, the women got to know her and can trust her behind the camera. And then something that people don't always think about is our is the audio recordist because the audio recordist sits in there for every single interview and they're the ones putting the mic on people and um, so they're really close and they you know they have the headphones on and they they may be the one that has to say excuse me a truck just went by and we really didn't hear that last. Thing oh, yeah. So um, so it was, you know, and then with the tears, I mean, you look around at certain points during that during an interview and I have the cinematographer is is crying. And yeah. OEP Sam is crying and the audio recorders is crying. So um, so I do think that all of that helps to build trust. And it, and it continues even with um, with the launch of the series, because then you're you're talking to everybody and then we're, we're doing, um, you know, PR and stuff. So the, you, the, the earning their trust, I feel like, is something you do every day. And that's such a great responsibility that you take on. And I'm sure that adds to the pressure of actually trying to tell this story, but also trying to maneuver through all of these personalities and making sure that you share the truth to this. I can't imagine what that's like for you as a job. And, and I wanted to ask you about your career because you've been doing this for so long. I mean, you, you've, you've made some great projects through the years. I mean, if we could, how did you start? Why did you, why did, you know, why docu-series, documentaries, short form? How did this kind of grab your attention when you were starting off? Well, uh, I started off when my daughter was in uh, eighth grade and she was going into high school. And, um, and at that time I was a single mom and I was thinking like, what do you, I was trying to find some source material on, <laughs> on what to do with, uh, with a daughter going in, into high school, because, you know, we all have different types of memories about high school. Either you loved oh, it yeah. or you hated it. And, um, and I didn't find much. And, um, at that time I was doing actually just marketing and advertising communication stuff. And I was getting into video production and, um, and I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. Maybe, um, I could do a documentary about the girls going through high school. And, and your daughter so was like, no way. Are you kidding me? You're not oh, going to yeah. die. I like, please, are you kidding me? Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, I did one interview with my daughter at that time and, <laughs> and that was it. She, she preferred being a mole and coming home from school. And going <laughs> she's, on. she's deep undercover in high school. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, uh, so that was a series called high school confidential, which was on um, WeTV, right? 2008. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And then I, and then from there, and so I really started out with female centric 
kinds of uh, storytelling and and kind of stay close to that. I kind of veer off into different things um, here and there, but I um, but female centric stories are really important to me. And so then I went on to then do uh, more series and more films. I actually did a second season of High School Confidential. We TV asked me to do it again and find another find another city to do it in, and so I did it in um, in Chicago. Oh, that's amazing! I. I love the female centric uh, of it all because I believe that those are the real stories that we need to hear, you know, and I feel like TV podcasts, all of those things are able to push those stories forward now more than ever before. And I think it kind of provides this, uh, you know, comfortability for women to come forward and share all of these stories, which seem to be very similar. And I love that you get to highlight this, but at the same time, I just imagine the mental toll it takes to keep going and your experience as a woman yourself, but then to hear all of these other women experiences. And I was watching Let Us Pray and I have the privilege of being a white straight male that, you know, I went to Catholic church. I was an altar boy. I was all, but nothing weird happened to me. Nothing, you know, like, and then you see these stories and you see how real it is. And it, it's so hard because you want to believe in the world and you want to believe in these, these structures, religious structures and things of that nature. And when I was a kid, you did like if a if a pre like a priest was like you know a form of a parent, and you see through this story how it was abused time and time again under the name of God. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it was unbelievable, and um, you know every day after we would do an interview or we were um, you know just filming a scene or something, it it, it does it just. It, it weighs on you and you just, uh, I mean, I love each of the women that were in the, in the series. And sometimes after an interview, I just wanted to hug them and take them home and just take care of them, make them tea and take care of them because, um, it, because it's just, it's unfathomable, the things that happen to them. Um, and, and especially when there were, when there were instances where their, their parents were also brainwashed. And, um, and so these kids didn't even have, you know, as kids, they didn't even, they didn't have the love or support and they had nowhere to go. And they also had no, um, perspective on what was happening to them because they weren't, they were never told that that was wrong. And in fact, some of them, like Kathy Durbin was told that it, it was her fault. Yes. And some of them came from broken homes. So this was a way to actually ingratiate and actually have a sense of community, which I just then thought, you know, it's like, man, then it sets these women on a course for the rest of their life unless they reclaim their narrative. And so many people don't get the chance to do that. And I thought that's what was so powerful is just these women claiming their narrative because you can point out to the fascinating stories of Jack Hiles, Jack Schaap, Bruce Goddard, John Jenkins, who are highlighted in all this really horrible, horrible men in my, I don't think in my opinion, I think they just are. But at the same time, I think what really triumphs is the women's stories, because I think the nitty gritty, dirty stuff of the details, of course, that's like a car crash we can't turn away from. But then it's these women reclaiming this like, you know, Ruthie Heiler, she founded the Blind Eye uh, Movement. What is the Blind Eye Movement for my audience? So uh, the Blind Eye Movement started in Gaylord, Michigan, where um, where some some of uh, Ruthie's abuse happened, and some and the other in other women at, um, at at Grace Baptist Church. And after I believe it, they formed that right after Sarah Smith's article came out, and they thought, well, you know, now we're using our voice, and now we, you know, there's there's power in numbers, and let's get together and do something. So they formed the Blind Eye Movement, and then they started getting support and um, you know, other people, women especially from uh, around the country that started to join. And it's really just um, they want to be a, a place for people to come to, to share what's happened to them, to get support, um, also to talk about what legal possibilities. I mean, they're not a, a legal organization, but they can help and talk about what, what they did in their store, in, in their lives in terms of lawsuits or going to the to the police. So it's a real Really powerful organization that's um, continuing to gain momentum. Um, can you speak to the different, like the the fundamentalist, like Baptist? This is the independent fundamental Baptist. Can you explain the difference of the breaking off of the IFB? Oh boy, I'm not really. An <laughs> Sorry, hey, that's a big question. Hey, big question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it's just um, it's an organization that um, that says they're independent. They they're based on the King James. Um, is that it? The Bible? King James Bible, I don't yeah. even know. Uh, yeah. And it's, um, but it's this, um, kind of a, 
a sect that, I mean, the big thing to me, um, because it was established by uh, Jack Hiles in the 50s when he broke away from the, the, large, the larger umbrella. Um, but the big thing to me is that they claim that they're independent, but they're really such a systematic intertwined group of, of pastors that just really help each other out and cover up for each other. Have you found in any of your research that these men realize that they're evil, that they've done evil things, that they've, you know, like, that's the thing that I kept while watching this is like, you know, any kind of personal responsibility, because it was always excuses. It was always, I mean, there's even one gentleman that just, uh, there's a, there's a phone call, I believe, where he's like, you know, admits to wrongdoing, but won't really admit that he actually did the thing that he did to the girl. And I just thought, wow, like, what did these men go through in their minds? What is their thought process that they're doing? And especially when the teachings of the Bible are involved in all of this. I, yeah, I know. Uh, it's mind boggling. Uh, I, I will say that I, I believe that there are some um, IFB pastors who are, uh, who really do just want to be um, a good person and a good pastor and um, that they probably have, um, you know, congregants who know that about them. Um, but I, I personally didn't, um, have that much interaction with the, with those people. Yeah. Um, and good, good. yeah. And I will say that those, um, like Bruce Goddard did not return my phone call. Um, uh, you know, that, uh, Jenkins did not want to participate in the documentary. And from what I see now, because there's oh. been response in sermons oh, Sharon, that have been online about what happened, uh, about the documentary, it's, it's unbelievable to me that people are, um, like there's a past, an IFB pastor who's online. Um, you can, you can find it. He says, um, Ruthie, why would she go out to Washington? She's 14 years old. She was abused at 12. Why, why would she do that? Like she really knew what was going on and she wanted to go or, um, or there was another one, um, about Rachel that said, well, my daughter was her roommate and she was bragging about having an affair with the pastor. Okay. Well, if a kid is bragging about having a relationship with a pastor, maybe there's something wrong here. And maybe that's not even true, which it wasn't even true that she did that. So it's, I, I, I don't, I, I, I think they have, I don't, I don't understand, you know, it's, it's, it's fodder for a psychologist, but it's kind of like, they think they are above the law, above God, equal to God. And that what they do is if it's considered bad in any way, it's not their fault. And they really well, exonerate themselves. I mean, the culture of victim blaming, we see that everywhere. Um, you know, this is four parts. Did you set out to do a four-part docu-series or was the story so large that you needed four parts and you found out after you finished filming? I really needed eight parts. <laughs> but you can Well, by the way, I was wondering, will there be, I mean, I, I was wondering, would there be a season two sharing more stories and also sharing what's happened after this got released? Because I wanted to talk to you about after this got released and potential reactions from the IFB. But I did wonder like how you pieced this together in four parts and what potentially hit the cutting room floor stories that we potentially didn't get to see. How did this become four parts? Yeah, it's a, it's really challenging because, um, you know, when I went into it, I wasn't sure if it was going to be a feature doc or it was going to be a series. And then it did seem like as we were filming that there are lots of stories that we can intercut. So it, it was more of a series than, than one, than a one-off. Um, and like you said, there are so many stories. I mean, we just really touched the surface of some of the stories that, that you, some of the women that you meet in there, like, um, like there's this woman, Brianna, and there's a man, Amanda Clydens, and there's so many other people that we didn't really get to tell their stories because you have to decide when you're doing this, unfortunately, whose story can we, can we really tell, um, that, that gives a, a good arc that's a beginning, middle and end. And some of the stories like with um, Ruthie and with Kathy, like they hadn't been to, to um, court yet. So we yeah. were able to tell some things in real time. And also Amanda Householder's story, um, her her parents, um, the trial had not started yet and it still hasn't started yet. And they're, they're, um, 
they've been charged with over a hundred uh, felonies of all types of abuse. And so that, that trial will start in, uh, will start next year. So it was really, is so difficult to, uh, to cut down. I mean, that's, that's, that's the hardest thing because you do like, you learn about these stories and you, you, um, not only want to amplify their voices, but they're really compelling stories and compelling voices. So yeah, I vote for a season two. <laughs> Well, I mean, listen, I, it really is ripe, and I am curious about where a lot of these stories head and the good that can come out of a series like this because it gets people talking about this. It really brings it out into the light, such a dark topic and a dark subject matter, which I'm telling you guys, this is a this is really kind of, this is an intense watching, a viewing experience, but it is well worth your time, but you have to really know what you're going into, but I think it is really worth it, but I just wonder, as a filmmaker, you know, this is such heavy material. Were there light moments for you at all? I mean, did you ladies share laughs in the course of this because it was an all female crew? I imagine there is strength in that. And at a certain point, you know, you're like, we are reclaiming this kind of narrative. Was there any positive moments through filming? Yeah, uh, yeah, there definitely were. And I think there's one scene um, that we always internally just called um, meat and cheese. Um, and that it's in, uh, it's the end, in the episode, in the end of episode three, where, where the women meet in Wildemar and they're, they're outside and they're having cheese and crackers and, and <laughs> wine. And, um, I mean, there was, there was conversation among us of, do we, do we not, is this too light? Are we making, are we making light of this very serious situation that they're in? And what we wanted to show is that, yeah, these women have, have been abused and they have lots of hard days and hours and every day, but they're also people who enjoy life and have a lot to live and have a lot to celebrate. So we wanted, it was really important to us to include that, include that scene because we do want people to know that they don't go around every day, just thinking about um, their abuse and feeling like a victim. I mean, they feel more of a, you know, they're, they're survivors and they're real people a lot to celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Yeah. That is and, so important to show. Yeah. And in terms of, uh, reclaiming, because you've mentioned that a couple of times, I do want to say that um, we were very intentional in terms of the um, the setups for the interviews and the interview environments. Um, and we talked to the, each of the women about like where they would be most comfortable being interviewed to represent a space that they will reclaim. And so, um, and there were places that they rejected and places that they suggested. So, um, like for instance, Amanda Householder is interviewed in what looks like an isolation room, which represents the boarding schools that, that her parents owned and made her give punishment to kids in. So, um, having that stark room with the one, you know, light bulb was really emblematic of what she had experienced, but we also didn't want it to be a triggering experience. We wanted it to be a positive experience in a place that, that, that we could re they could reclaim. So like at the end of it, and we shot this, but we didn't use it. Like she pulls down all the carpeting off, off the walls, you know, and kicks the box away yeah. and stuff. So we, um, so all of the spaces were, were very, um, intentionally chosen. You're directing these interviews with these women. Are you also the person asking the questions directly in those scenes? So throughout this process, my um, my partner on this was uh, Sam Hake, and she's um, the co-executive producer. And so we went through this step by step together, hand in hand. And she did some of the interviews and I did and I did other interviews. Um, and uh, but we both we sat in on each other's interviews. So we were there together. And at, at the end of the way we like to do it is not interrupt each other. But at the end, we might then step in and say, um, you know, I have a few questions just just to add or I want to clarify. Um, are there moments throughout the course of this? I always wonder this being a fan of docu series in general that you were surprised there. You were surprised with the information or the story that you were giving something that you didn't expect in pre interviews or anything like that. Were there moments with these ladies that you felt that? Oh, did I cut out? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Sharon. That's okay. Uh, um, no, I was just saying. 
as a fan of docu-series and the process of uh, making them, when you're doing these, was there anything that actually surprised you in the moment that you didn't see here in a pre-interview that you're interviewing these women and you're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea, like a moment or a story that you find out through uh, production? I would say that, oh gosh, so many stories, so many of the stories did surprise me. I mean, they were shocking. Um, I, you know, because we didn't go into, because you have to, I think, you know, be careful when you're talking to people about traumatic experiences. So in pre-interviews, we didn't always go into everything because we didn't want to have them relive that and talk yeah. about it so many times. So, I mean, almost every, like the story that Kathy Durbin talks about in those isolation rooms and, the, and one of the girls being turned upside down in a chair and and then her uh, for hours and then her uh, the the pastor coming in and then shredding her teddy bear in front of her while she's upside down. Like those kinds of stories, you just sit there and I, it's just shocking. And, and the audience like it, then pictures that. I mean, the like yeah, we're sitting there hearing yeah. this and you can you can visualize the entire thing. And then it's like you realize this is a docuseries. This isn't narrative. I mean, this isn't fictional narrative storytelling. Yeah, I know. You just you you can't write some of the stuff that that we heard. Yeah, I mean, and it is interesting then, you know, going through some of the footage you use of the preachers and you're like, of course, they're being like doing weird, dramatic things. That's what they do on their their pulpit, their stage. I mean, it's all this show. They're they're deranged, de de demented men. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the release of this, this came out on the 24th, I believe. And I think it's really gaining traction through coming out on Max. It's got a, you can see the, the really, the, the beautiful artwork there on the front screen of Max. Uh, it's there for everybody. And they really do make a, a, you know, a good job of promoting that. I've noticed the last couple of times I've seen on Max. Um, uh, but uh, what has been the response of the IFB? Yeah, it's, um, I'll tell you that um, from hearing, because I'm in touch with the women every day now, especially since it's come out, and um, there are literally hundreds of women who are coming forward now and reaching out to these women. And I know I spoke to the prosecutor in Gaylord, Michigan, and he just met with five women who want to press charges. And, um, and then there's a whole church, an IFB church that has never had any abuse, um, they, allegations um, that have come out. And they have like several that are now going to come out. So there's um, there's a lot. It's and and like I said before, it's just so rewarding as a filmmaker to see that happen because people are are raising their voices now. Yeah, I mean, do we know how many active IFB churches there are out there as of today? So the estimate that I've had is about five thousand, and that there are eight million people that are associated with those churches. If you pick any place on a map. And go one a one mile from there. There's an IFB church, and people just are totally unaware that the Handmaid's Tale life is like right down the street from them. Yeah, the Starbucks of religion. Um, uh, but also, uh, you know, the women. We we you know, this is coming out, and more women are coming forward. But have you gotten blowback from these churches themselves? Of like, this is not us, because I would think that they would get more protective, more insular, and actually try to take down this docu-series and punch a bunch of holes on it. Have you had that experience yet? Um, I'm waiting for that to happen. Um, there have been some, some um, sermons that have been online that really, have, yeah, that have been, uh, yes, <laughs> quoting and, and, and kind of um, making their own statements and ridiculous responses to the, to the docu-series. Um, so um, that those have been kind of, kind of crazy, but um but I am just waiting because I, I cannot imagine them staying silent for that long. Yeah, me too. I, I was I was watching this thinking, oh, I wonder what this response will be and what they are planning. At the same time, it's so interesting because this isn't filmed in this fantastical way. It's very real. It's not because I've watched a couple of things actually on Max lately about cults and other things like that. And there's always this ridiculous element to it that kind of pushes it over into almost reality television land. Mm -hmm. And this isn't that. Let Us Pray is not that. It's very real. So I don't know sometimes if these people actually watched it, how they would truly argue uh, their points. It's like, I'm glad you're good or you think you're good, but the, the, the system that you've set up is rotten to the core. Oh, yeah. I mean, the things that I've seen online are saying that the women are lying 
Yeah, Even I read some of that. People, yeah, uh, their abusers have already gone to prison. So isn't that wild? They can still maintain that it's it's very shocking, just unbelievable. Yeah, belief a uh, belief in uh, something is sometimes a very dangerous thing that actually clouds your vision. I found through so many things, but you know, you, even those sermons, I'm telling you, Sharon, that's the perfect way to open season two of this. Season two, we start with the sermons uh, uh, of this, which actually is kind of gratifying in some sense because I even think that then the IFB members will be curious and that it's out there on Max and it's out there on ID Discovery where they can watch this and you're not trying to hide this. This isn't something, this is something that has been researched. These women are telling the truth, you know, believe these women. And I think that is the best argument you would possibly have is watch the show. Right, 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 exactly. You want to help me produce it? I do actually. I mean, this really, I was really, and by the way, I want to say you're from, you're, you're from Overland Park, right? Yes. I grew up in Olathe, Kansas. Really? Wow. Oh, you just cut out. That's amazing. Oh, sorry, Sharon, you just cut out. Oh, sorry, you just cut out. Oh, I said, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, is Oak Park Mall still there? Is Metcalf Mall still there? <laughs> Metcalf Mall is not. <laughs> oh, no. It's been that's a while flattened. since I've been back. Yeah, no, I, gosh, that's where I grew up. And, and uh, yeah, it's, I just was reading your history. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Overland Park. That's amazing. Um, but uh, I guess right now, it seems like you're very actively involved still in these women's stories. You said, oh, gosh, five more women came forward. They're pressing charges in Gaylord, Michigan. I mean, it seems like you still have your you know nose to the ground of just really these stories. Is there a is there for you as a filmmaker? Is there. You know, sometimes with actors, they say, oh, you know, after I'm done with the part, I've got to put it to bed. For you, though, as a filmmaker and something very real, you can't put this to bed, per se. But I'm sure you want to cover other stories and things like that. How, as a filmmaker, do you handle something like this once it's released? Uh, well, this is kind of the time when you get even closer to your subjects, I feel, when it when it's when you're we've launched this together out into the world. So I feel like there's a big connection among the subjects and um, and our team uh, on the production side. Um, and uh, yeah, I, yeah, each each of my projects are kind of like are kind of like children. So, you know, I. I usually stay in touch with people because I always want to know what's going on with them. And they're so used to like giving you updates on, wh on what's going on that uh, they continue to. And I kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, well, um, any of the women that were involved, the main women, what do they think of this? Are you allowed to share their reactions to watching all four parts of this? Has, has any of the women had problems with any of the narrative that was told, or are they all really proud of this? Um, you know, that's one of the scariest parts of yeah. uh, being a filmmaker, because I, uh, I, we, sometimes you have the opportunity to, um, to show them in person and you get their, get the reaction. We, we were not afforded that in terms of time because we were editing right up until when it uh, came out. So um, I was, I, I was anxious then when it first came out and, you know, we were all like on a group text and then I had individuals, you know, texting me and, um, and it was so rewarding for me and, and Sam to hear, to, he, to see these texts that they're like, you told my story beautifully. It's exactly what I, you know, what I hoped it would be. I'm glad you didn't put this scene in. I'm so happy with what you did. So that was really, that was so rewarding. And I'll say that all the women felt that way. And then um, Amanda Householder very sweetly said to me, you know, there was just one little part. <laughs> I wish we really like gave more talked a little bit more about how these um how these uh women these girls homes really were were formed and we could go into the background and not have it so much about Jack Hiles and I and I said I understand because we really we actually had that and we had edited it out but um but yeah so there's a whole thing on how the all the group uh those um reform um schools got, um, you know, got started. So, um, that would be great if we could, if we could do something like that, but I, and I understood, and I felt like, you know, she was right when, when she told me that. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think all of these women, I was touched by each one of their stories for my audience or any other audience, 
you know, do you ever think about how the audience approaches something like this, how you want an audience to go into watching something like this? Because in this day and age, it is hard to get eyes on anything. And this is, you know, you, you know, the, this is a very important story. But like I said, it's a hard story. Like, what do you want audiences to know going into this? And how do you hope they receive? Well, I hope it's a cautionary tale. And I hope that, um, that for parents who watch it, um, this is just something for like general um, abuse in terms of parents knowing, like getting some ideas of what, how they can prepare their, uh, their daughters for being around men who might be predators um, and then how open they are to listening to them if something has happened and not to be afraid and to believe them. I mean, always err on believing the woman, like, What's the worst that can happen? I, I just think you, uh, it, it, you know, what I've learned too is that women, like, why would someone say this if it wasn't true? Like, why would anyone want to, because there's so much yeah. shame involved in that. Um, like, I, so I, I think that there's, there's, you know, that women should be listened to. Um, anybody, anybody who's talking about being abused should be listened to. And yes, there might be the, a case or two where someone is not, it remembers it differently. Um, but I also hope that people look at this um, and know that if it's them, if this, if this is a story that is related to something that's happened to them, that they can do something about it. And if that something means that they get support, if that something means that they just, they get help in being able to tell their story, or it's in terms of criminal charges, like there is something that can be done. Um, yeah. there's also a thing about statute of limitations in different, in different states. And so I do hope that people pay attention to that. And, and when legislation in their states come up, that they realize how important it is for women to be able to tell their stories of abuse years later, because many women can't even deal with it or realize it until 10 years later, 10 or 15 years later, but because it's so traumatic. And this also points out that, I mean, this is not just religion, you guys, this is everywhere. I mean, we have so many stories of a power dynamic of men abusing a power dynamic with a younger woman. I mean, like we even this to throw it to pop culture, Puff Daddy is now facing a lot of charges of women coming forward from 15 years ago. And there's like a pattern of behavior. You always have to look at patterns of behavior. And I think that's such an amazing thing that, you know, docu-series and things of that nature are now bringing to the light, but it's the same story all the time. Yeah, like Nanette in the in the film who, you know, her abuse happened, gosh, probably 40 years ago. And she says that when she when she's come out recently, people say to her, why didn't you say this before? And she and she actually even says, I did. I did. But yeah. nobody listened. Nobody listened. That was that. that, that and that's me. And and she didn't have the benefit of social media, of of docu series, of being able to get that message out. And I think if we have all of this, this is such a great way to use these platforms, even if it is sometimes harrowing to hear. But we have to face what actually is going on in the world. And you know, let us pray. Really does that with both feet planted on the ground. And I just think, wow, it really was a very uh, a powerful watch. Um, and I, I hope you guys will check this out. And I guess just as a fan of you now, what are the other stories that are intriguing you out there in terms of women? Do you have a list of dream projects? I know it's it's bad luck to ask somebody what they're doing next, but at the same time, I don't know when I'm going to talk to you next. And like, what do we have in the pipeline? Because, you know, I know all documentarians and, and filmmakers, they usually have like, oh, I've got six projects going on right now. What is next for you? Uh, well, I just had another uh project that was released on the on the uh, New Yorker platform called Parker. And it was a film that uh, premiered at Sundance this um, in, in January. Um, and that has um, actually Oscar qualified. So, um, oh, yeah, so I'm, uh, so I'm, on the, I, I'm, on, I'm on the campaign with that. Um, oh so that's been so sometimes, you know, it's the it's after you your projects have this world after it's been launched into the world. So um, so I'm working on that. And then I have definitely have some things that are that are in development right now that you will love to hear about soon. I mean, do you <laughs> trust your do you trust your gut now? Was there a time when you were like, I don't know if this makes a good story. And now through your career of like, if I see something and it kind of gets my spider sense tingling, do you trust your your initial reaction now with something? 
That's the such a great question because uh, I just realized that the other day that I was thinking I didn't trust it because uh, because there were stories that were coming in and I was like, mm-hmm. and I'm like, well, wait, maybe I just don't know. And then this one came in <laughs> and I was like, I'm, I'm going after that and I'm all into it right now. I love that. That's what, I mean, listen, I think the audience loves that too, of like how these things get made and how ideas actually come to our screens. Because I think this year, and you know, it's like, we are in this year of like amazing docu-series that you can really dig into. That's going to show you a different part of the world, but there's similarities with all of us that I think kind of rise to the occasion. And a lot of you women out there, you have your own stories. And I think that is, it's so important to bring those out into the light. And I think Let Us Pray does that so brilliantly. And you guys, you can find this. It's uh, ID Discovery, but the, you know, right now I watched all of this on Max on the home screen. It's right there. It's four parts. You can break it up. You can watch it all at once. Maybe I suggest breaking it up a little bit uh, because each one of these kind of delve in great framing devices and uh, really uh, uh, disturbed me, but also gave me hope for the future. And I think that's what it leads leaves you with. Um, so Sharon, go support her and also go find this Parker. Let's get her, let's get her an Oscar. My, I, I don't know where can we watch Parker? You can find, go to, you can Google Parker film, the New Yorker and, uh, and it'll come up and it's, it's free. You can watch it free. Well, you, you said the magic word, uh, our audience loves free, but, uh, Sharon yeah. Lee, thank you so much for being here. Really powerful piece of work. And, um, you really just hit it out of the park. And I just really, uh, really appreciate all of these women that, that were in this. And I, I'm really, um, I'm really excited to look forward to what they do with all of this and where this yeah. goes from here. And I do hope there is a season two of some sort. Well, thank you. And I also want to mention that um, Discovery ID has been such, they've been amazing to work with. And there's been a bunch of women that I, that have been on the team on, on that end. Um, and they have been so supportive and so emotionally invested in these stories um, and, and how empowering the women are that it, uh, it has just been um, just really a joy to work with them. Well, I, I think, and I get that actually in, in dealing with some of the ID discovery team, you know, they really do believe in these stories. And we were talking to like, this is, this is real. Sometimes you'll get docu series that has a kind of fantastical element where you can kind of like, you know, there's a little bit of a laughable moment or you can make light of it. And I think this is such a great example of, you know, just really straightforward storytelling. So thank you. And congratulations, Sharon. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much.